Welcome to the top 10 most compelling costumes for Game of Thrones for Season 7, Episode 2, called Stormborn. Last week's episode was awesome, and we had a lively and engaging exchange in the comments section. But this week, costume-wise, it's a bit more slim pickings. So I've added a few costumes from last week just to round out the list a bit more. And the lighting didn't do much for the costume. It didn't do it any favors. So the episode started in the dark and then ended in the dark. So I've tried my best to gather pictures that you can actually see. Before we get to the countdown, however, here are some awesome creations from some of my viewers. And if you want to share your costume creations or cosplay images, and it doesn't have to be Game of Thrones, feel free to email. I've left my email in the description below. So first up is YouTuber Verena Valkyrie's creation of Arya Stark's Bravos costume. So Verena, she hand pressed all of the pleats on the skirt and hand knotted the jacket from scratch. She also did an awesome makeup tutorial for Dark Sansa. I'll leave Verena's description of Arya's costume and links to her YouTube channel in the description below so that you can check out her awesome videos. Next up is another fantastic cosplay of Daenerys' wedding dress sent in by viewer Larissa. She made this costume for her daughter Steph, pictured here, to wear to a Comic-Con type convention in Australia, and it, that's called Supernova. I'll leave the details of this costume in the description below, and Larissa's also sent in more cosplay pictures that I'll share in future episodes. Finally, while this isn't a costume per se, viewer Emily shared with me her nail art, inspired by Queen Cersei, complete with Cersei's crown and green wildfire. Thanks everyone again for the submissions, and please keep them coming. I love seeing your creativity. And you can also see all of these on my Twitter page. Thanks again to Verena, Larissa, and Emily for your awesome submissions. So warning, there's going to be spoilers in this episode for everything that's happened in the show so far, and more importantly, the new season of Game of Thrones, uh, episode two. So come back and watch this after you've seen Stormborn. So let's count down what I think are the most compelling costumes in episode two, starting with number 10. I couldn't make out Gilly's costume too much in last week's episode, but it was so nice to see her out of her wildling rags we've come used to seeing her in. So here she's wearing a shift of sorts with a shawl over top. I think it might be night clothes, but I'm not quite sure. The shift has pretty burgundy embroidery, almost folk art style detail. So I hope to get a better peek at it in the coming episodes. Lady Alice Carstark, the new head of House Carstark of Carhold, pledges her house to House Stark once again when called upon by Jon Snow. She's the daughter of Lord Harald Carstark, who fought for House Bolton, who died at the Battle of the Bastards. Alice's costume, it's very simple, without any of the embellishments of the greater houses like the Starks. And you know, the greeny color kind of reminds me of the dresses worn by the women of House Frey. The house sigil for Karstark is a white sunburst on a black field, like we see on the Karstark soldier, but there's no sign of it on Alice's costume. What's more important, however, is that Alice now wears her father Harald Karstark's sword belt and sword. You can tell because the pommel is identical. Like Alice Karstark, Lord Ned Umber, seen here, pledges his house to House Stark once again after being called upon by Jon Snow. The young lord is the new head of House Umber after the death of his father, Lord John Umber, who's also known as Small John Umber. Small John, who fought for House Bolton after his betrayal to the Starks, was killed by Tormund at the Battle of the Bastards. The sigil for their house is four silver chains linked by a central ring on a dark red field. You can see the insignia represented by the chain that holds his cape in position. Again, his costume is very simple, which is a small bit of fur on his collar. Both Small John Umber and Lord John Umber, commonly called the Great John, also wear their family sigils by way of the cross chain. And like Alice, Ned Umber has the sword of his father, Small John Umber.
Samwell is very modestly dressed in a sack tunic, trousers, and rope belt. Without the robe and chain, however, Sam looks very much like the sorcerer's apprentice next to Archmaester Marwyn. And I think the idea is that the garments are worn 24-7. We know that the maesters must wear their maester chains to bed, which is why, perhaps, their clothes look like they've been rarely laundered. And you can see the grime and filth on the cups. Sam's in particular is filthy because of all the chamber pot cleaning, food serving duties, and blood and guts from the autopsy lab. Sam's garment is a simple, crudely made tunic from linen or possibly hemp. It's likely that the Order of the Maesters make all of their own clothes, and maybe they even get a link for sewing. Sam does wear an undershirt with the idea that it would get laundered more frequently and perhaps he would sleep in just that. In the close-up on the left, Sam wears a penannular brooch to fasten his tunic in place. And these brooches are worn all over Westeros, but I notice that all of the maesters wear them too. It's a bit like an apprenticeship pin for Sam. Pictured on the right are hand-sewn tucks on the shoulders, indicating that his shirt is a hand-me-down that's been altered. Tucks are added to shorten a garment. Randall and Dick and Tarly are summoned to Cersei's throne room wearing matching brown leather gambesons. Randall wears a burgundy sash, the color from his house sigil, and a brooch in the shape of a striding huntsman, also taken from the house sigil. Costume designer Michelle Clapton oftentimes uses sashes on the men, like Tywin Lannister and Mace Tyrell, for example, to show a higher status or nobility. So as you can see, Dickon doesn't wear one. Dickon does wear a burgundy cravat tucked into his collar, something that we see commonly on younger nobles like Jamie and Joffrey. The other thing to note is that Randall is wearing a brigandine under his gambeson, and you can see just a bit of it, looking like dominoes, but they're actually little riveted plates underneath. I think this shows that while the summon was diplomatic in nature, Randall is rightly guarded. I also wanted to point out that Randall appears to wear armor routinely, like in this costume from season 6, although I question whether this might actually be hunting armor, and you can see the stamped sigil crest on the front of the red leather tunic. Varys has consistently worn kimono-style robes throughout the six seasons, so what a surprise to see him appear in this garment. After the speech that Varys gave to Danny at the opening of the episode, I think that Varys is trying to show, through his clothes, his unbridled loyalty to Danny. The garment itself is gorgeous and one of the best from the episode quality-wise. In this close-up, you can see the beautiful chevron textured fabric, and it looks like there's been a bit of gray paint applied to create additional texture. The crossover piece is bordered with this mermaid scale textured trim with nice mitered corners, I might add. And I think that Michelle Clapton has had the fabric machine embroidered because this design looks very similar to the trim on Oberon's coat. Viewer Paige Lessa Tamari had pointed out to me, this style of coat appears to be inspired by the Mongolian deal. So here are two examples. On the left is a Mongol silk lampus weave deal from the Christie Auction House in London. It's a kind of Mongolian cloak that's traditionally worn with a sash. The coat originates from Eastern Iran or Central Asia from the late 13th or first half of the 14th century. And on the right is a Mongolian winter deal from the late 19th, early 20th century. The winter deal is padded with sheepskin or cotton wool. This coat is made from plum silk brocade. It's lined with beige Mongolian lamb and trimmed with full skin with fastening of knotted ties on the right side. Lady Olenna is barely visible in this scene. I've brightened it up a bit, so it looks like she's wearing brown, black silk brocade. But like always, it's hard to tell when the lighting is this low. At the end of season six, she wore black to mourn the loss of her son and grandchildren. With the puff sleeves and shawl collar, I can tell that this is another outfit entirely, although her hat might be the same. The cut of her season seven costume appears to have shoulder seams and set in sleeves. And like the outfit on the left, Elena wears a pleated silk scarf tucked into her bodice. I hope we get to see more of this costume and in better lighting. <laughs> 
Here is another of Danny's new costumes. I'll get into more detail in episode three because they showed very little of it in Stormborn. Clapton says of Danny's transition in Dragonstone, you know, Danny has now moved from the heat of Marine and she's come north, so we obviously see her covered much more than we're used to. And then her army is the Unsullied, so we're trying to blend it all and make them become a force. This look is very clean and simple without any beating, in keeping with her meeting with her war council. She does wear this silver three-headed dragon pin, which will feature more prominently later. And the rigid collar, looking a bit like armor, is a throwback to her leather collar in Young Kai. Here is Michelle Clapton's sketch of Danny's costume on the left, and a set shot of actor Amelia Clark taken from the side. In the sketch, Danny wears a cape, which we will see in the next episode, The Queen's Justice. Jon Snow knows nothing except when it comes to fashion. Oh, he may plead ignorant in the presence of Sansa, but he really does know how to dress with aplomb. Costume designer Michelle Clapton says in an Uproxx interview, that's a big heavy cape. And yes, it is him as Ned, but he's actually not Ned. I think what she's going for here is that Jon is becoming his father, both as a leader and in his dress, but he still has to find his own way. Last season, John was in browns like Ned Stark and wore this beautiful velvet jacquard cloak made by Sansa, seen on the right. John's leather armor with metal plates sandwiched between the layers is now black and his full length robe is trimmed in fur. I can't even imagine how heavy this costume must be, considering that Kit Harrington wears a gambeson, trousers and a shirt underneath all of that. The wolf pelt, however, looks the same as last season. Here's a few details from his costume. His leather belt is stamped in a basket weave pattern. He's added a plate metal gorget with two embossed direwolf sigils. And the cape fabric, I mean, it's a bit hard to tell, has an almost bark-like texture on the charcoal base. Alaria Sands Dorn costume is the light in a world of darkness. I never thought I'd be so happy to see her. Alaria somehow manages to take a masculine garment and make it sexy. Now, the Princess of Dorne, she's taken Prince Doran's Indian brocade coat and sassed it up with some pointy shoulders and a sexy brocade bra top. She's also added a hammered leather belt, although for the life of me, I can't see the pattern. Maybe something vipery. The bra top looks like the one seen in previous seasons. The band is made from hammered leather. One of my favorite details is this slashed vent at the back. As far as the show goes, Alaria is the only one who wears costumes with the extreme pointy shoulders. Bear with me while I go on a bit of a shoulder pad tangent. Just to show you how smart my viewers are, Susie I'm Wonderland pointed out to me that Aloria's shoulders might have come from the Caucasus burqa, not to be confused with the traditional Muslim garment. The burqa, like the ones pictured here on the left, is a traditional men's felt coat worn by those inhabiting the Caucasus region, an area in Europe that borders Asia. The distinctive broad shoulders give the wearer a broader silhouette. And Red Army Commander, Vaisali Chapayev, seen in a portrait on the right, wore a burqa as part of his military uniform during the Russian Civil War. Susie also wondered if there might be a fashion influence, so I thought I'd check out the late American couturier Charles James, famous for his highly structured aesthetic. Here is a 1930s silk evening jacket that has a similar silhouette, and it's on display at the Met in New York City. There are also a ton of contemporary fashion designers doing their thing, including this custom outfit by Marc Jacobs for Lady Gaga on the left, and Rihanna seen on the right in a Balmain jacket. The shoulder pads have returned to the runway courtesy of French fashion house Balmain. It's not the first time that the runway has borrowed from Michelle Clapton and vice versa. So for now, the mystery of the shoulder pads remains largely unsolved. Shoulder pad tangent done. That does it for this week. What were your thoughts on Stormborn? I'll be back with another recap next week and hope that we will have some awesome sweeping exteriors so that we can get some better looks at the costumes. In the meantime, you can check out last week's most compelling costumes in case you missed it. Thank you so much for watching.